very warm greetings to everyone in the audience and to Nilufa Oral, my very dear friend, and I'm absolutely delighted and very much looking forward to your lecture today. Um, I will make a proper introduction in a second, just a few housekeeping uh, messages here. Please post your questions in the Q&A section. And after the lecture, I will read out uh, your questions. Um, and uh, this lecture will again be recorded, um, so you can use it even after it has happened live. live. And um, yes, yeah, so I would like to make uh, the formal start and introduce Nilofa. And I'm really delighted to introduce uh, to you today Professor Ra, who is not only a leading international scholar who combines several areas of international law in her research, but also a very fr a dear friend of mine. And she's also one one of the co-organizers of this entire series, as you know, many of you have already been with us for uh, the previous seven lectures. This is now lecture eight in our On the Road to COP26 and CMA3 preparatory lecture series. And this is organized by Professor Oral and Professor Christina Vogt and myself. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to be doing this so far. And we've just discussed that there are many um, colleagues and uh, a wider audience that is interested in this series. And um, these uh, recordings are also of use after the, uh, the several lectures and they have been uh, viewed on YouTube. Now, uh, Professor Oral is uh, the director of the Center of International Law at the National University of Singapore and is a member of the law faculty at Istanbul Bilgi University in Turkey. Now, she's a member of the UN International Law Commission and they're a co-chair of the study group on sea level rise in relation to international law. Now, she served as a climate change negotiator for the Turkish ministry between 2009 and 2016. She's also appeared before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So she combines this knowledge in international law, climate change law and the law of the sea. And she's a distinguished fellow of the Law of the Sea Institute at Berkeley um, University of California, senior fellow of the National University of Singapore Law School and a honorary research fellow at the University of Dundee. She is a member of the IUCN VCL Steering Committee, and she was elected to the IUCN Council in 2012 to 2016 and served as the co-chair of the WCL Specialist Group on Oceans, Coasts and Coral Reefs. Now, I'm supposed to make this very short, but I will just add that uh, Professor Ral is also the series editor for the International Straits of the World Publications, a member of the Board of Editors of the European Society of International Law Series, Board of Editors, um, where she also serves um, for the International Journal of the Marine and Coastal Law, an associate editor of the Research Perspectives in the Law of the Sea, and um, she also serves on the International Advisory Board for the Chinese Journal of Environmental Law. And she's published numerous articles, as you know, and edited several volumes and books. And she has spoken at many international conferences. I'm very much looking forward um, to this lecture today, uh, which of course takes um, place now against the backdrop of the most recent scientific evidence again that has uh, firmed up uh, for um, the IPCC um, sixth assessment report, the contribution of working uh, group one. And um, what we can derive, I'm not going to go into any details. I'm going to give the floor to Nilofa here, but what we can see in this report is that there's clearly a warming that, of the oceans that's taking place, a sea level rise that will continue for all different five emission reduction pathways uh, that the IPCC or the Working Group One sets forth. So this problem is not going to go away, even if we can manage to bring the world on track of a very low uh, emission uh, pathway for the future. And I'm really interested to hear now from Nilofa how international law uh, can respond to <coughs> this um, problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, dear Petra. Uh, you are overly generous in your introduction, but I thank you for that. 
And may I say that um, I have to thank you for uh, the effort and energy that you have put into this series. Unfortunately, I was not able to participate in all of them, but you have been the constant thread uh, and an important one. And also Stan uh, has been a wonderful support. So my sincerest thanks uh, to both of you. And Christina, I know, is teaching uh, this morning, so she's not able to join us. Um, so today, I'm very pleased to be talking about a topic that is very close and dear to my heart and some a topic that I've been working on for some time, and that is this ocean climate nexus. And I will be looking at it from, of course, the focus of the series, which is Glasgow and beyond. Um, and so the title is Streamlining the Ocean uh, into the Climate Process. And I do have a uh, PowerPoint, <laughs> that is probably too long, <laughs> but I'll do my best to get through it and not overburden you. Um, and I will say this, it's really the first time that I'm making this presentation. Uh, and so I'm trying to um, look at the climate uh, ocean nexus really from the perspective of the negotiations. Uh, so if I, it's not comprehensive, it's not exhaustive, uh, but I certainly hope that it will highlight issues. And, uh, and I welcome those of you who may be experts as well um, to, for your input, um, because it's a rather complicated process. Petra and I were talking about uh, the climate change process in general, and, and it's really very complex. And the ocean uh, adds a different level of complexity. So I am going to put on the share and... Uh, I hope you can all see it, yes? It's there, excellent. All right, so here we start. Streamlining the ocean into COP26, and it should be also uh, SMA3 and beyond. I should correct that. So, so, so many of you may already know the importance of the ocean, but I think it's important for me to start off by highlighting um, why this is such an important issue. Um, so we know the ocean is 70% of the Earth's surface. It is an absolutely integral part of the climate system. And we know that the definition of the UNFCCC on the climate system includes the hydrosphere, which is the ocean. Um, it is also an important sink and reservoir for absorbing carbon dioxide. Uh, already the ocean has absorbed uh, approximately 30% of the carbon dioxide, and we will go into more detail of what that means. Something else that you know, I have a picture of is the famous Gulf Stream. And it's the Gulf Stream that is so critical to ensuring, for example, that Northern Europe has the relatively moderate mild climate that, that it does. But there is evidence that because of the warming and glacier melt, um, that this is impacting the Gulf Stream, um, which is also critical to our climate. And also, of course, the ocean has provided a very important reflective force um, against solar radiation. Having said this, um, there's no doubt how important the ocean is. Has it really taken the prominent place in the climate system? And I'm focusing on UNFCCC, so not everything. The UNFCCC system um, that it merits. And to be quite honest, you will see, and I'm going to make the case for, no, it has not. Um, and let's see. So, you know, the, the ocean is warmer than it's ever been since they've been keeping records. It has absorbed 90% of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is why it is such an important sink and reservoir. Sea level rise, it's amazing, but the science shows that it's, been, it's, going, it's rising faster uh, than it has in the last 3,000 years, uh, and most of it really in the last um, decades. Uh, and we know it's ocean, it's ocean warming, thermal expansion, and of course the uh, melting and rapidly melting, it's scary. Uh, we're watching the news. This is Greenland and we know that for the first time we had rain um, and this bodes ominously um, for glacial melt and ice sheet melt, including uh, in Antarctica. Um, the impact of ocean warming is widespread, but coral reefs particularly are being impacted. And even though they may not account for much of Earth's surface, but 
coral reefs are absolutely essential to um, the marine ecosystem. They provide habitat to 25% of marine systems and they are dying. Uh, they are actually dying. Uh, and for those interested in the economic aspects, we know coral reefs are important for uh, tourism, but also uh, protecting against um, um, storms and surges that are increasingly um, happening more often and uh, more intense. The impact on fisheries, we're all, all of this is happening. So we're not talking about projections. Uh, this is all happening. Ocean warming has impacted fisheries. Um, and we'll continue to do that. And in some cases, some are actually benefiting because we know uh, like mackerel, uh, sardines, they are moving to colder water, moving north. We actually are even having political disputes about this. But in the meantime, we can also lose fish stocks in addition to migrating fish stocks because it impacts their ability to spawn, their growth rate, uh, distribution, abundance. The ocean, because of global warming, is also losing oxygen. Um, and this has a tremendous impact on marine life who also require oxygen. And the IUCN a few years ago had a, uh, did the first report on, and, and really highlighted um, these issues of acidification. There has been a 26% increase in acidity over the past two centuries. And most of it really, um, I would say in the last century, of course. This is critical again, because what it means is that um, shellfish cannot form the necessary um, uh, shell or skeletal. Um, and I won't get into the technicalities of it. Um, so what that means is that um, they can't survive. It will attack the food web. Um, and again, for those interesting in the economics, it's a huge industry built on shellfish. And, um, and it's a multi-million, maybe billion dollar industry. And they are already seeing the consequences of ocean acidification. Now, one thing I want to stress is that um, ocean acidification, for example, is a purely carbon dioxide issue because the ocean has been absorbing uh, what we said about 20, 26% of the carbon dioxide, that is the reason. Um, and so this has implications for how we will address ocean acidification. So now the next way, so this was just, I glossed over the, why the ocean is important for the climate, uh, for, for, for climate and climate change uh, processes. So now what I want to do and I'm going to try to do is to show you um, how the ocean has figured um, into the UNFCCC system um, through the IPCC reports. And we know the IPCC reports are really important for informing uh, the negotiation process um, and actions and processes that will take place. So this is kind of very quickly, it's, I'm, I'm, I can't go into too much detail because of the time, but I do want to start off with re recalling that in 1989, a group of states, and they were the small states at the Small States Conference, they back then drew attention to sea level rise. So sea level rise has been on the international agenda for a number of decades now. And in their declaration, they highlighted um, um, what then, they foresaw as the increase in global temperature for 2020. So here we are in 2020. So it's interesting to look at that. Uh, and, and they also highlighted that even if emissions were to be stopped, and then it was global warming, of course, now we say climate change, sea level rise would continue. And we know that that is absolutely established now. That is a fact that has been confirmed by all the IPCC in the latest reports. And it also detailed a list of actions. And importantly, um, was for the negotiation of a framework convention. This was before the UNFCCC convention was adopted. Now, I highlight this because when we start looking at the UNFCCC system, there really isn't any reference to sea level rise issue. And it's been there. And so let's start looking. So the first IPCC report, 1990, um, and this is taken from the summary uh, for policymakers. Um, it really did highlight, of course, uh, ocean warming. But if you look at um, the, the 
point made. It's about that um, the net uptake of carbon dioxide may decrease because of ocean warming. And this has more to do with the, looking at the ocean as a, as a sink, um, as an absorbing, um, um, a natural absorber of carbon dioxide. Um, also, it also highlighted um, sea level rise, all right? So by this time, we know sea level rise, um, global warming is taking place. Now I want, I'm gonna do is feed this into, how is this reflected in the UNFCCC? Well, the ocean really was directly reflected in the objective, right? So the objective we know in article two is about stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations um, at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. It goes on, it's a long, it's a long objective. Um, and, and as I said earlier, the climate system does include the ocean. Can we fit in, you know, sea level rise into this? I don't know. What we do see though, is that in article four, um, one D, it does talk about, and again, it's not a, a hard obligation, by the way, it's about promoting the management, cooperating, conservation and enhancement of sinks and reservoirs. And that would include uh, oceans, coastal marine ecosystems. So in the UNFCCC, the ocean is seen as um, um, an important component of the mitigation process. Um, now let's go on. We have after that the 1995 second assessment and here there's more attention on, on sea level rise. Um, also it's looking at the impacts of all the ecosystems including oceans and what may the impact be on bio, um, biological diversity and um, ecosystems as well. Um, so uh, the what, again, uh, it, it highlights um, sea level rise, flooding, and importantly, I think the impact it will have on coastal areas. And so it gives specific numbers about how many millions of people will be impacted. And as we were talking about, it projected that it will continue to rise beyond 2100. So we know that sea level rise, despite the objective it seems, um, is gonna continue. The question is more, so what have we done about it? Um, and it says in 1995, the stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations does not imply that there will be no further climate change and that sea levels will continue to rise for many centuries. So in 1995, we had a pretty dire uh, projection for sea level rise. So in 2001, um, again, now we get more detailed information about uh, global warming, um, the, how it's reducing the uptake of carbon dioxide, the impacts of sea level rise uh, and storm surges. 2007 is now the first reference to ocean acidification. So in 2007, um, the IPCC has recognized um, ocean acidification and that there is a significant change. And, 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 and this is a change that we've not seen in thousands of years, actually. Um, so ocean acidification, 2007. I'm highlighting, I'm highlighting the dates and there's a reason. Um, 2014, once more, um, now we have a, a, that, that there's been a, a number um, of 26% increase in acidity. Um, and it goes into more detail about the ocean has absorbed about 30% of the carbon dioxide, and this is the cause of acidification. And half of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide between 1715 and 2011 occurred in the last 40 years. It's a very short period of time in the global tra historical trajectory. And um, that um, the global ocean will continue, let me just see something, to warm during the 21st century. So in 2004, by 2014, we have a very serious uh, uh, photo picture of the global ocean in relation to climate change. Oops, what happened here? Hold on. Hmm. Hmm. Let me just do this. Oh, I hope I didn't freeze. Ah, okay. 
Uh, all right, all right, I'm going to go. And it, it goes on again, uh, decrease in oxygen levels. Um, oh, here's something I wanna stress. Sea level will rise in more than 95% of ocean area. 70% of coastlines will have sea level rise. It's quite serious. 2014. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep going because where I really am heading is 2015 Paris Agreement. Where are the oceans? <laughs> well, it's in the preamble, so that's good. Um, the oceans was specifically mentioned in the preamble. And then Article 5, it basically refers back to Article 4, 1D of the convention. So here we have all this IPC scientific data and the ocean is simply not, sea level rise isn't there, ocean warming isn't there, perhaps it's implicit. And I will tell you something, because I was uh, part of the process. And in fact, I actually promoted having that ocean language uh, in the preamble. There was a great deal of concern that the ocean would be forced into this and kind of destabilize the negotiations because the negotiations were so delicate. So there was, it wasn't that there was not awareness, but it's a political process. And so at that point in time, and because the negotiations were very difficult, they're very complicated, adding in this other element uh, raised some concern. Um, so I'll just say that much. Um, because there were others who were, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, who really wanted to see um, the ocean um, uh, integrated into the system. All right, so the Paris Agreement. So at this point, we won't have much direct reference to um, uh, the ocean, but what we have to look, about, look at is <clears throat> how does the ocean fit into, can we retro ocean? When I say ocean, I'm using it very broadly, but on the other hand, it is important because we're talking about very specific problems, consequences of climate change, ocean warming, ocean acidification, sea level rise, chemistry change, acidific I said that, acidification. And so um, the idea that, oh, well, the ocean can be a beneficiary of mitigation actions taken we have to question that, is that an adequate response? Or do we need to have specific action focused, geared towards the ocean uh, in general? So here we have, a, what do we have? Paris Agreement, of course, introduced importantly, the National Determined Contribution, which I'll talk about. Of course, adaptation became a global goal. It was give equal um, importance and weight to mitigation. Uh, I have not put in mitigation here, um, but because but that is you know a given. Loss and damage, of course, very important. Financial support, uh, technology development and transfer, capacity building, the transparency framework, and the global stock take. The, the question we have is, how will ocean impacts fit into this? <clears throat> All right. So the efforts to streamline the ocean into the UNFCCC, I've just selected. There's been many activities going on, but first of all, I wanted to pay tribute uh, to Biliana, Dr. Biliana Sissin, who was really a very important voice, not only in oceans, but particularly for climate change in the ocean. And beginning in 2009, uh, the Global Ocean Forum, Forum, under her leadership, organized at every COP major conferences about streamlining ocean into climate or climate change in ocean. And the reason I highlight this is that it's been in the background for a long time, pre-Paris. Um, there has also been meetings at the UN, the United Nations um, informal consultative process has also taken up issues. For example, in 2014, this was before Paris, an ocean acidification, uh, but since then, of course, they've, they've had other ones and most recently on sea level rise, which, you know, sea level rise since 1989, um, there was a declaration by the small uh, states conference. There, now, um, as I said, actually, uh, during the Paris um, uh, conference, uh, COP, 
there were a group of states who were actively trying to promote um, the ocean being integrated into the UNFCCC system. And they developed the, uh, because, <clears throat> because uh, the ocean declaration. And, and, and so here, this was important as well. All right. Now I want to look at what has happened since 2015. So we see when we get to the 2015 Paris Agreement, there's a lot of background going on for the ocean, but it has not been streamlined into the main formal process. So are we making pro progress since that? And here's my attempt at trying to summarize uh, what I said. And, and that's why now Glasgow is important. Why? Uh, what has happened since then, um, since 2014? Well, in 2016, a decision was taken by the IPCC um, to develop the Special Report on Ocean and Crime Sphere in a Changing Climate, which was adopted in 2019. I'll look at that. Um, COP23, under Fiji's presidency, launched the Ocean Pathway. COP24, we know we had the Paris rule book um, was adopted, not completed, maybe in Glasgow would be completed. And COP25 was the big expectation for the blue COP. It was um, uh, co-presided uh, co by Chile and Spain. And the highlight was in the ocean and climate nexus. And there were many, many side events. And I say that because side events are not formal events, but they're important, absolutely, because they, form the groundwork um, for eventually formalizing um, action. And then in 2020, um, they had the Ocean and Climate Change Dialogue under the um, a chair of the SBSTA. Um, and I'll look at that a little bit more in detail. And of course, just, just a few weeks or a couple of months away, we have Glasgow. So the ocean pathway was launched and its purpose was to increase the role of the ocean and considerations in the UNFCCC process and increase action priority areas impacting or impacted by ocean and climate change. It is an ongoing process and it's very important. Um, now, we also know that the Paris rule book was adopted, um, but not completed in COP24. And the question, but this isn't in there though. So the ocean doesn't figure in the Paris rule book. So what we need to be looking at, and they are looking at that, is how to streamline the ocean into that process on NDCs, adaptation, loss and damage, finance, technology development, transfer, capacity building, transparency framework, and the global stock take. Now at the same time, um, in 2019, I already mentioned it, but I'll go into a little more detail. The much anticipated and very important special report on oceans in the cryosphere um, was, um, dis was, was um, dis released. And no surprise, of course, and I'm just giving some highlights from the summary by the uh, policymakers. Global mean sea level rise is rising with acceleration. Um, ocean warming is increasing and we're seeing intensified marine heat waves, intensified acidification, loss of oxygen, salinity intrusion and sea level rise. Over the 21st century, the ocean is projected to transition to unprecedented conditions with increased temperatures. And also the famous Atlantic Muriel meridional overturning circulation, the stream is projected to weaken very likely. And, it, and there's more, of course. Um, so we see that the, 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 the projections and the, the diagnosis and prognosis for the ocean under the 2019 uh, special report is quite dire. And again, I'm just highlighting because of the limitation of time. Well, the good news is that um, the ocean was finally taken up uh, by the Nairobi Work Program. In 2018, it was placed basically on its agenda. What is the Nairobi Work Program? Um, it is a process um, to facilitate, and this is from the uh, UNFCCC website, to facilitate and catalyze the development and dissemination of information and knowledge that would inform and support adaptation policies and practices. 
So again, we're looking at the adaptation aspect um, of the of oceans, not mitigation, not looking to see how we would mitigate um, the input um, into ocean acidification, for example, but still adaptation is absolutely critical. So in 2018, it was made part of the Nairobi program. Um, the oceans and coastal ecosystem was made a priority area. Uh, and we see that in the SBSTA 50 in particularly. Um, so in the SBSTA 48, um, it basically concluded that it should focus on certain issues and those include oceans, coastal areas, and eco ecosystems, including mega deltas, coral reefs, and mangroves. In 2019, SBSTA uh, asked the Secretariat to prioritize certain thematic areas. And again, that included the oceans, et cetera. Um, uh, one thing I wanna highlight, in E, it had a slow onset events, and sea level rise is considered a slow onset event. What's interesting in SBSTA, you don't see that category, but it may be just included, of course, in the oceans category. So we have it in the Nairobi work program. Um, and in the summary in 2020, uh, they issued a summary of action points and here highlighted the urgent actions need to be taken to scale up adaptation and build resilience. And it's this work is done to the um, Nairobi work program expert group on the ocean. And I've listed here the members of that ocean. So that's important. We also had, as I mentioned earlier, the ocean dialogues. Um, and the ocean, this was a decision taken by um, the COP or the SBSTA to organize this ocean dialogue. Normally it would have been held in, uh, uh, physically, but this was an online event, which maybe was allowed for greater participation. And so it was very open. You had uh, governments, you had non-governmental uh, organizations all contributing to this pro progress. Very important, but I have to say again, these are informal processes, but still important. And the synthesis report is available and I will touch upon that in terms of future actions. But um, again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into detail. One thing I wanted to look at as we prepare for Glasgow is you know, the SBSTA, they're preparing. And I looked at the chair scenario note. And unfortunately, and really, again, there wasn't um, um, oceans and coastal areas were only kind of included um, as part of the, uh, within the will be work program. So we still don't have the ocean as a standalone separate um, uh, part of the SPSTA pro process, but hopefully that will happen. And now, of course, and, and um, uh, Petra mentioned the sixth report, and just very briefly to go over it, um, it's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Um, it is virtually certain that the Global upper ocean has warmed since the 1970s. Um, it is virtually certain that human caused carbon dioxide emissions are the main driver of current global acidification. Um, there is high confidence that oxygen levels have dropped. It goes on, of course. And here, of course, it's interesting. It gives specific numbers. Ocean warming accounted for 91% of the heating in the climate system. With land warming, ice loss, and atmospheric warming, and kind of about five, three, and one percent respect respectively. That is quite amazing. Ninety-one percent of the heating in the climate system is for the ocean, and really, we have not been paying attention to the ocean in, within the UNFCCC system, except for the IPCC reports. Um, as I stated earlier. Um, Global mean sea level rise has risen faster uh, since 1900 than over any preceding century, at least the last 3,000 years. Um, and here, of course, we talk about the heating of the climate system, and it goes on. So it's a very 
the, 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 the place of the ocean and the climate change nexus is, couldn't be more clear. So let's look at the processes. As I mentioned earlier, um, national de determined contributions, and many of you are probably aware of it, when it was what was um, codified or introduced um, first in Warsaw, but then subsequently in the Paris Agreement. And it allows um, each uh, state to determine how they will mitigate. Um, it's country driven. Um, and, uh, and they report that um, to the secretariat. And this becomes, of course, uh, it's, there's now a registry. And uh, we've had the first batch in 2020. And now uh, in 2015, I'm sorry, 2016, actually. And of course, initially they were intended nationally determined contributions, but when states became parties to the Paris Agreement, then they became part of the nationally determined contributions under Article 4. Uh, so the first batch came in 2016. Um, some were updated uh, in 2020. Uh, there was a very well-known study done that looked at 70% of 161 NDCs and 103 included ocean-related issues. Now, the NDCs also can include adaptation measures. So while the objective, of, of course, is to increase ambition on mitigation, uh, adaptation, of course, is also very important. So many, many states included adaptation measures and most of those, of course, were related to ocean, but also you had some looking at ocean um, as mitigation uh, for mitigation purposes as well. So uh, 192 parties have submitted their first NDCs. Um, 102 have updated them, and this is as of this month, last week, 2021. Now only 11 have submitted their second NDCs, and this is supposed to be every five years. So every five years, par state parties are supposed to um, submit another NDC that has to be more showing progressively higher ambition. And that's an important part of the NDC. The first NDC is the baseline, but par state parties have to become, have show more ambition, um, progressive ambition through each NDC subsequently every five years. And of course, each of these NDCs are gonna be critical to feeding into the global stock take under article um, 14. Now, the Paris rule book was important because it really detailed the information um, that has to go into um, or that is to go into the NDCs. And the question is, how does the ocean fit into this? Because right now it really isn't expressly in there, but certainly states can and should and will include the ocean. But even if they do, how will that feed into the next important stage, which is the global stock take? Um, so the global stock take is coming up soon in 2023, and it's under Article 14. And basically, through all the actions that are being taken to um, um, achieve the uh, temperature target of Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, um, which is to you know well below two degrees centigrade and all efforts to meet one and a half degrees centigrade increase in, in global temperatures. Um, um, uh, the global stock take in 2023 will be the first collective assessment of where um, state parties are in terms of meeting um, the objective um, of the uh, Paris Agreement. But it also includes adaptation, which is important. Um, and also, I mean, it's very broad. I have to say the, 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 the global stock take is very, very broad. It will also look at social and economic consequences, issues of equity as well. Um, so this is really the linchpin. The global stock take is absolutely critical because it will also inform what takes place next, future actions. Uh, in updating and enhancing nationally determined contributions and how to cooperate. Now also, um, Article 7 of the Paris Agreement makes express reference to the global stock take. And, um, and that's important um, that, we'll, that 
the global stock take is not simply about mitigation, it's also about adaptation. But again, putting this all within, within the uh, ocean context. And anyway, I had to put this um, slide in because this is uh, an amazing illustration I took from the IPCC website preparing for the global stock take uh, in 2023. And it just shows you how complex and technical this is and quite a challenge. Um, but anyway, I will try and simplify because it is important for streamlining the ocean uh, into is a formal part of the UNFCCC. So the first stage um, will be information collection preparation. This is really critical. And this is where all the information will be fed in. Um, and that could be reports, studies. Um, and this is where, of course, uh, ocean information um, is important. The next step then is the technical assessment uh, of all this information. And, um, and this is where, um, of course, they're going to synthesize it um, and look into how we're meeting, uh, states are meeting um, the long-term goal and what opportunities that there are. And then the third will be consideration of these outputs. And basically this is going to be the discussion at a high level. Um, all of this is taking uh, place under the chairs of the uh, subsidiary body for implementation and for scientific and uh, technological advice. And they are to develop guiding questions for each component. And the question is, of course, we hope that we will see oceans as part of this, which is very important. There are four thematic categories, mitigation, adaptation, means of implementation support, and cross-cutting issues such as loss and damage. I mean, the loss and damage is also sea level rise is a very important part of this. And again, mitigation, adaptation, means of implementation and support. It's very important that the ocean issues have to be made uh, part of these through this process. And this again is just a, um, just to give an idea of, uh, it's, very, it's much more complicated. I don't wanna go into detail because I'm still trying to digest the process myself. But there will be a joint, there is a joint contact group, which is very important, joint contact group of experts to assist the process. And there will also be technical dialogues um, to support um, the joint contact group. And again, bringing expertise together. One thing though to highlight is that the ocean dialogues that took place, the ocean and climate dialogue are not part of um, these technical dialogues. They are not formally part of the global stock tape, although um, I, hopefully they're gonna feed into it. And so the big question is when the next um, SBSTA takes place in Glasgow, um, how will the ocean be addressed? Because right now in the um, informal chairs a note, it only seems to be within the Nairobi work program and not beyond that. And I think it's very important um, that we have to look into formalizing um, the role of the ocean. And so here's just, again, from the IPCC website, it just shows you the process. We're now in 2021, the global stock take is just two years ahead. There's a lot of work that has to go into it. Um, and hopefully by 2050, uh, we will have achieved net zero emissions, but what will we have achieved for the ocean? And this is the question, ocean acidification, sea level rise, um, chemistry change, deoxygenation, um, and more. All right, COP26 and beyond. All right, so this is basically, I'm coming to the end. Um, so the, um, the reports, really have provided ample data to show, to support the need to formally integrate and streamline the ocean into all UNF's triple C activities and processes, including, you know, we need some cut decision signs. Uh, we need to develop modalities to directly address these specific consequences. I really do not think we can just look at the ocean as being an incidental beneficiary of mitigation and reduction of greenhouse gases uh, without having much more directed action. We know, again, ocean acidification is a carbon dioxide 
And I was reading today that look that there's, you know, um, the idea of looking at reduction of methane to reduce global warming, which is very important, but it will not impact the ocean or ocean acidification. Um, so we really need to start having, looking at a standalone ocean work stream. Um, it really is um, a bit, it's well due in time. Um, ensure that ocean coastal areas be part of all reporting communication processes. Right now it's voluntary, but I think we really need to have much more of a systematic um, method for this, developing the methodologies uh, for this as well. Incentivize sustainable ocean activities. Um, for example, you know, REP plus for mangroves. Um, and really just ensure that um, the ocean will be part of the stock taking. I mean, directly, not incidental in 2023 and beyond. Um, so, and I just want to get to my last um, slide here. Um, so I, I hope I've been able to show you that since 1990 until now, the scientific information and activities concerning the concern about the ocean climate nexus has been growing, it's very clear but it hasn't been reflected in the UNFCCC process adequately. It's been a slow and informal process. And there's no question that we need urgent action at Glasgow to formally integrate the ocean into the UNFCCC process, especially the um, global stock take. And I'm going to quote from the informal uh, summary made by the SBSTA chair report on the ocean and climate change dialogue, because I couldn't agree with it more. For too long, the ocean has been out of sight, out of mind, and largely absent from the global policy conversations on climate change. But the tide is turning. And hopefully in Glasgow, we will see um, real uh, action and real change. So thank you very much um, for your patience. And, um, and as I said, it's, it's a big issue. I tried to go over it as much as possible. It's not comprehensive, but I hope at least we can provoke some conversation on this. Thank you very much, Nilofa. I think it was very comprehensive. It was a fantastic lecture. I think everyone will agree that this was uh, um, comprehensive, very insightful and very thought provoking as well. And uh, very important to highlight that there has been this neglect um, for, for the oceans. And I think that also highlights that, you know, when, when you took on this topic, you know, it, it was almost like this is a a topic that it, it's outside the UNFCCC process and it shouldn't be. So I think you've really highlighted here how important it is. So thank you so much. Uh, I think it was a very, uh, very insightful, fantastic lecture. Um, I can see that there are already two questions in the Q&A section, but I will just take the privilege as uh, uh, the moderator of the session to um, ask one question. And I think that relates to COP26. So, um, do you see any signs in the preparations now, especially in the, you mentioned the subsidiary bodies, that things will change for the ocean? I mean, the IPCC report couldn't be clearer and it has been clear for quite a while. And uh, we seem to be so unable to follow in policy and in law what the science tells us. So, I mean, there's a general problem, I think, with law not being able to trace scientific evidence to incorporate it in a meaningful manner. But do you think it will change? Are there any signs, positive signs, that we are not just concentrating on Article 6, but perhaps also on the oceans more? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Petra. It's a, it's a very important question. And, and I do think so. I think that the ocean community has really galvanized a tremendous attention uh, on the ocean. And the IPCC reports uh, couldn't be clearer uh, and to me, what was just uh, eye-opening or popping um, was the finding of 91% of the heating is from the ocean of the climate system. I mean, how can you ignore the ocean? Um, I think the tricky part is how do we, um, how do we link specific consequences um, to the ocean? So, 
we have a temperature uh, goal and that's important. And there's no question that the reduction of global temperature to one and a half degrees centigrade will benefit ocean warming. Um, and I'm sure the scientists will tell us by how much. Um, but I think what we need to do is really have more clarity, formal clarity on this in the reporting systems. Um, and that's where the global stock takes. So we really have to understand the linkage between mitigation action taken and what this means for the ocean. Ocean acidification is more challenging though, because it is, you know, really, uh, even though of course carbon dioxide is our main greenhouse gas, um, but again, how do we link it directly to reduction of ocean acidification, uh, to a reduction of ocean acidification? Uh, adaptation, of course, becomes um, um, obviously the, the, the main component in many ways, um, particularly sea level rise. And here, uh, and I know this is an issue for loss and damage, the financial component, let's be honest, you know, sea level rise, it says that even if we do stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations, sea level rise is going to continue. And we know millions of people are going to be impacted by this. What are we going to do for this? Um, and um, we know that there's this huge disparity where the developed rich countries, they can spend tons of money on you know, taking artificial adaptation measures, building up their coastlines, whatever, to whatever degree, or artificial islands, floating buildings. But for the developing world, in particular, small island or the large uh, island ocean state, large ocean states, um, it's not possible. So the climate system, the UNFCCC uh, has to address this. Uh, this is, you know, the adaptation and, and, and financial means is very much linked. We can't ignore this. And this is an ocean issue. Um, so I can go on and on. I mean, you know, so there's so much more work to do. So to just look at the ocean as an incidental issue to the whole process is under, you know, reduction of uh, by loss of biodiversity will be good for marine life. No, we have to look at the ocean separately. So Glasgow will start it, I hope. I think it will. I am optimistic. Um, but um, uh, will it be enough? That's another issue. We'll see. Thank you very much, uh, Dilofa. I will start with the Q&A section now. So um, thank you um, very much. We've got the question here um, that asks, what would you say are some of the reasons that the role of the ocean in climate change has been overlooked in such a large way in the past? And it's from an anonymous attendee. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know. what. Uh... Particularly, okay, maybe, you know, 1992, the UNFCCC, again, that's why I showed um, that 1989 declaration, sea level rise, and the 1990 report showed it. Um, the science perhaps wasn't as clear as it is now, but my own personal experience is a political issue. Um, the climate change negotiations, for those who are part of it or you know been have, have watched them um, they're very complicated um, political delicate <laughs> so bringing in so forests for example I don't know it was a big forest component why the ocean didn't factor into it simply I think maybe we didn't have enough um, uh, data for that at that time so the forest had priority we see that um, so a lot of it is political issues. And when I say political, I don't mean in a nefarious way. It's just the reality. Uh, who has the stronger voice? What are the interests that are being heard more? But that's changing. Now, there, I do agree, the tide is straight. The ocean is really, the spotlight is on the ocean. Now it becomes a question of how to maneuver through this highly complex forest of climate change negotiations. I mean, Petra and I were talking about that a little earlier. Um, it's, you know, it's very siloed. And one of the, what we have to look at, and that's something that comes out in the synthesis report from the Ocean Dialogue, is how do we, you know, and this comes up in everything. How do we link the silos so they're integrated? How do we have a more integrated approach? 
Um, but as I said, in 2015 in Paris, there was real um, worry that the ocean would pop up as an issue to have to deal with and possibly derail <laughs> the very delicate and negotiations. But someone else in the audience may have some other insight. I'd love to hear it as well. Thank you very much, uh, Nidu Farbez. Um, and another interesting question that also deals with the question of what can we do as individuals? So here's a question from Elena Dominelli. How can those of us who are NGO delegates to COP26 make sure this is raised as an issue? It is usually impossible to be recognized by the chairs to large sessions, uh, as so many people are in the audience, depending on which kind of budget you have, of course, yes. So what else can we do? Yeah, thank you so much. I have to say, um, the, 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 the role of NGOs in the COP processes um, is, some, is a whole topic in and of itself, perhaps. Um, the one I know that in the different COPs I've attended, there is always a very distinct line. The you know, NGO physically where they could be, and you know, have your, and then the um, the official you know, COP negotiations. And I have watched a difference, if I can say some of you may be involved in the BBNJ process. Very interesting because in the BBNJ um, negotiations for a new treaty, uh, civil society has a very active and very well heard voice and role. I have not seen that in the climate change negotiations. So your question is important. Uh, and, and I think difficult. Um, I'm not sure in the COP that you can directly other than your delegations, um, but beforehand, it's very important. You know, ultimately it's states um, who will be taking these decisions. Um, so your own, you know, uh, states um, are very important um, to lobby them. Um, and, and, um, and again, with data, I mean, that's, it's just you know, very clear, the data. Um, but the role of NGOs in the COPs themselves um, is not, is, been, is limited, except for side events. The side events are very important, but they're parallel worlds. You know, so you have negotiations going on behind closed doors uh, in the COPs, and then you have the side events where maybe it's more interesting in many ways, because that's where all the information is. The climate change negotiations are, you know, sui generis. But I, don't, I probably didn't give you a satisfactory answer, but keep, I think the fact that we've gotten as far as that NGOs have been very vocal and active, science has been very clear. So just keep on. I mean, we just have to, just have to keep that message very clear and strong. Thank you very much, uh, Nidufa. There's a question now from Stephanie Shandov. Uh, this may be uh, more of a long shot, she's uh, saying <laughs> in advance, but uh, for developing countries that are largely ignorant, that's what she said, of the importance of the ocean, could the encouragement of early career ocean professionals be a pathway to making some progress in placing the ocean higher on the national and regional agendas? And this may then ultimately translate into a more coherent global efforts towards the mitigation of climate change and its impact on the ocean. Um, uh, all right, so as I, so, so I don't, is it for development countries? Yes, yeah, um, I, I thought it's developing countries perhaps. So I, that's what I translated. So I, I'm not sure whether yeah. they are particular. Yeah, I don't know if they're particularly, I mean, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, I think that, oh, so without that, public awareness is key. It's also part of the UNFCCC, you know, the convention and the Paris Agreement education, public awareness. It may be fair to say that, and that's I think what the timeline tried to show is the ocean um, for, for a long time was under the radar uh, in many areas. I mean, that's why for example, the BBNJ became so important. Um, you probably heard, you know, we know more about Mars, what's on Mars than we do what's in the deep ocean. Of course that's changing. We now have started the decade of the of ocean science. So the scientific aspect is absolutely critical and essential. And 
part of answering the question of why the ocean, you know, didn't figure prominently had to do, of course, with, you know, the lack of studies, which means you need to fund this research. So in terms of increasing awareness, we need to have ocean scientists everywhere in the world. And this is also part of, um, well, I won't talk about a lot of it. I mean, the, the, the legal, um, I think, obligation, we can get a debate about that. Capacity building, you know, technology, transfer and development, all of this means that building worldwide capacity, knowledge, the science in all countries, well, at least in all regions, uh, and of course, that will serve um, the future of ocean climate, very much so. Um, so it's not, you know, it, it's more a question of equity as well. Unfortunately, most of the science does come from the developed world because they have the financial ability to do this. Uh, and yet we know that most of the developing world are gonna suffer the consequences. Um, and so there are outstanding scientists coming from the developing world, but we need more. Um, so I would agree that, you know, that's something that we certainly can improve and strengthen. Thank you uh, very much, Nilofa. So maybe I can uh, just add something about the, the perception that developing countries, because the question implies that to some extent are largely ignorant um, of the importance of the ocean. I'm not sure that, you know, we, we, that is a point that could be debated. So I think some of the developing countries are especially um, aware of these risks because they are very much affected by the adverse effects of ocean acidification and sea level rise in terms of, you know, they're using the fish stocks, they are threatened by um, coastline changing. Um, so I think we, we, we have to be careful how we think about this divide, the developed countries and developing countries divide. And I would also say that some of these NDCs have been, have scored really highly. So you can see uh, there are some scorecards available on how well do countries in terms of submitting their NDCs. And we always think, oh, we are climate leaders, the EU is a climate leader. Uh, the UK is a climate leader. Maybe that's not always true, depending on what kind of parameters you use to analyze these NDCs. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be said about, you know, questioning this kind of divide between countries in, in some aspect. Um, I also have a question, but I will go uh, duly through the list first <laughs> before I ask my question. But maybe we can also encourage um, our uh, audience again to ask all the questions because now is the chance to do so. We've got an anonymous attendee again. And uh, the question is, would you say that the disparity between the speed of climate change and the speed of the passing of legislation has posed or will continue to pose threats to our future? Um, yeah. Well, uh, let's put it this way, that if we do not take uh, urgent, uh, we keep using that word a lot, but it's quite clear we have to take action. If we delay, the more we delay, the less will be happen. I mean, we already know that we're on the wrong track to meet the temperature target as it is. Um, so it's not just a question of legislation, but really taking action. That's why um, the um, climate change litigation is, is very important. Um, a lot of this is domestic level, but I thought what would be interesting, I'm throwing this in because what I'm not talking about today, you also have the Law of the Sea Convention, which is also, um, that's, a, that's another uh, presentation. But it would be interesting to see possible litigation being brought uh, to states in relation to the ocean and climate change. And it could be the Paris Agreement, but also be under the Law of the Sea Convention, because there are obligations states have um, uh, that are not directly climate change, but certainly one can make a very strong argument. Um, so absolutely, the slower we are in action, um, then the consequences are only going to get worse. And the time we have is very limited. This is what is uh, why the urgency is there is the window of time we have. And even then, I mean, the fact that should we even meet the objective of the UNFCCC Article Two stabilization, 
we're still going to suffer these consequences. You know, so it's almost like we have to look beyond stabilization. It's not enough. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely. And the IPCC was quite clear, um, wasn't it? That, you know, all five new reduction pathways mean that by 2040, 1.5 degrees Celsius will be will be achieved really. So um, that was uh, partly in, in relation to my question, but there's another one coming in here from Kimberly Graham, which I will ask first. So thank you very much for the very informative and clear presentation. There's some really nice remarks here, Nilofa. So I think you've done an amazing uh, lecture here for us. And uh, so she's interested to hear your thoughts regarding whether you think increased transparency in NDCs around specific gas reductions, such as specific reductions for carbon dioxide, would be one way to track progress towards action that specifically benefits the ocean. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. That's a really good point. And, and absolutely, transparency would. But what we need to do is have indicators. Um, we need to have, that's what I was saying. And again, I'm not a scientist, um, but to really understand um, the temperature um, reduction link to what this means for the ocean. And I'm sure there is. Uh, and transparency then would help in making uh, and understanding that so that when we get to the global stock take, we can have a clear picture of what do these um, reduction actions mean directly for the ocean. You know, we need to be able to have that assessment um, and formally. This can't be done externally to the EU and FCCC system. It has to be integrated into the system. So yes, I would absolutely agree with that. Okay, thank you very much. And there's one more question in the chat here. How is the uh, UNEP's emission gap report related to the global stock take? Well, they're, 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 they're all related, of course. Um, I mean, and that's the thing, I, I, in preparing my presentation, there, that's what I'm saying, it's not comprehensive because there's so many other reports out there that, are, that also inform and, and are linked to this. So, you know, so absolutely, um, these are all related. And, um, and, you know, we're talking about climate change, but it impacts biodiversity. So we also have, we have the IPBS report, 2019. Um, about the loss of biodiversity. And of course, climate change is a big factor in the ocean as well. So everything is linked. Um, and so we ideally should be looking at this holistically. And that's another issue we can talk about. You know, the UNFCCC when, well, in this global assessment, it's a very open-ended process. It's the information that will be submitted. So all this information is gonna be fed in. Now, how they're going to synthesize that, that's a big challenge. Um, so, so we'll see. But uh, so we shouldn't be separating, um, you know, different um, data. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I can maybe ask uh, one more question, Ilofa, as well. So, um, and that relates to the science review that we have now, uh, again, um, in a new version, in a maybe even clearer version, given that the IPCC looked at attribution studies and also introduced some new terminology around these compound extreme events that also affect the coastal areas in a particular way. Um, and I think what really was quite striking and, and very worrying is that regardless, even when we achieve the lowest emission scenario, the pathway that foresees the lowest emissions, we will still reach the target of 1.5, the lower temperature target already in 2040. And the question is then, can we maintain it or will it go, will the temperature rise further towards the end of the century? Will we be even um, um, emission negative after 2040? So there are these five different scenarios. And um, I was just wondering whether you think, will this now um, direct the attention really towards what this means for oceans because the IPCC is so clear that this will be for millennia to come even still affect the ocean regardless of the pathway or will that or the science is phrased in a way that it becomes too big to think about and the focus will just be on these five emission uh, pathways and so parties will just kind of jump on the general mitigation adaptation uh, conversation and discussion and again not giving 
sufficient attention to what this means specifically to the ocean. So I, I'm really worried about this point that we again fail to take the science into account because it's almost as if this is something for the future again. Yeah, I think you made a very good argument, uh, Petra, for why we need to have a completely standalone separate component for oceans yeah. under the, the UNFCCC system um, for exactly those reasons. Um, because it is it, the, the, the pathways, um, the scenarios, um, even if we, you know, as I say, meet the goals, the temperature or the um, stabilization goal, it's not going to adequately address the continuing issues for ocean, you know, and, and let's face it, the ocean is the source of life, <laughs> you know, uh, whether, I mean, economically, socially, um, biologically, um, so we can't, we can't, we cannot afford to, to ignore or minimize um, the importance of the climate ocean nexus. And again, for that reason, it's so important, I think, in Glasgow, they have to set the, you know, um, uh, path, a separate ocean path, pathway, whatever work stream, I mean, technical names, but, uh, and, 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 I, and I think you gave a very good, you know, some very good reasons why. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this, uh, the idea to have a separate work stream, I think that's a really fabulous one that hopefully will be, realized at COP26. I was also wondering whether you could maybe say a few words about the report of the ILC on uh, sea level rise in really <laughs> international law and sea level rise. I think uh, if that is possible, I think that would be really interesting how that ties in with the discussion that we've had um, so far. Yes, I would be very delighted to, absolutely. So uh, for those who don't know, in 2019, the International Law Commission uh, placed on its uh, uh, current work program, the topic of sea level rise in relation to international law. And we have three categories, uh, law of the sea, loss of statehood and protection of persons. The first category um, is a law of the sea and I'm co-chair of that category with um, Bogdan Oresco, who's also a foreign minister of Romania. So my co-chair is a foreign minister. <laughs> and then the other co-chairs, there are five co-chairs, uh, Patricia Gavotelas and Juan Jose uh, Ruda Santelario and also Jacube Sisse. So there are five of us. And um, we uh, prepared a first issues paper, which if you're interested, you can find on the ILC website on the law of the sea and basically mapping out um, the law of the sea issues related to sea level rise, particularly maritime zones, um, because what the concern is, it's, is that, and it's happening, because of sea level rise, the baselines from which maritime zones are measured or islands, well, well wait, let me just start with the baseline, could be inundated and that can impact existing maritime zones. Those maritime zones are absolutely essential. Imagine um, that's the exclusive economic zone is a very valuable um, area uh, for fisheries, but for all resources in general, it's 200 nautical miles. But in reality, that could be much larger if you're talking about island states. There's also the concern because of sea level rise that um, islands that are fully entitled to all these maritime zones could turn into a rock and lose their exclusive economic zone. I'll just put it very simply. So we're, we're looking at those issues and we just met, had our first meeting of the study group um, in Geneva in June and July. And the report is out on the meeting. And I think you'll see in it that we had a you know very, you know, good discussion about the many, many issues. Um, and here is a question. So I'll throw in, not the ILC view, but my own personal view, because we're talking about adaptation. And when we think about adaptation to like sea level rise, usually it's uh, whether we're talking about um, artificial adaptation or nature-based, right? 
planting mangroves, you know, fortifying the coast. But also how about legal adaptation? So why can't we look at law as also an adaptation measure? In which case it would be allowing states to be able to maintain maritime zones in face of human induced uh, uh, sea level rise from climate change. So I, I don't wanna go on, I can go on and on, but, I, but basically uh, we've, we've kicked it off, um, but it's a continuing study uh, and uh, we'll see. So we're looking for practical solutions to this problem of how to preserve existing rights uh, of states um, in their maritime zones, um, which again, the consequences are quite serious. Uh, can be quite serious, particularly if you're talking about the loss of island status. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think it's absolutely fascinating, especially the change in, in, in the baselines. Uh, there has been this declaration between the Pacific um, states, hasn't it, that they have agreed that they will maintain their baselines and the status quo. So how is that? Will that set an example for other states, do you think? Or will they be the only ones that have made this decision? Um, yes, uh, yeah, the Pacific Island Forum states, they, they issued just recently a declaration, very important one, uh, where they have basically stated that um, that uh, their view that the Law of the Sea Convention, which they respect, um, doesn't prevent them from preserving existing maritime zones. And of course, these are always ones that are lawfully established and that they're under the Law of the Sea Convention, there is not an obligation to review and update uh, charts um, for notification of maritime zones. It's a very important declaration. And, um, and I think that um, it, it, you know, Pretty well, all states are very under, understand the the issue and the importance, particularly to um, the Pacific Island states and other you know island states as well. Um, so it's early to tell, but I'm I'm hoping that this will actually have a positive effect. One, the Pacific Island states have been at the vanguard of highlighting the the issue of sea level rise. I mean, my goodness, 1989, that was really from their part. Um, and for many years at the UN, in fact, for the ILC to take on this issue, they were very vocal about it. So now it's time for other states to take up the mantle because uh, it's a real problem and we have to find real solutions. Uh, it's not a theoretical academic question. So I'm very optimistic and hopeful that this declaration will actually generate um, positive responses from other states um, and, and will help the work of the ILC as well in moving this uh, question forward towards you know, real solutions that do not upset the balance. I mean, the Law of the Sea Convention, very important, but, um, and there may be some difference in interpretations, <laughs> but I think that really the Law of the Sea Convention isn't, doesn't really address sea level rise because it wasn't an issue between 1973 and 1982 uh, when it was negotiated. Um, so this is an issue that developed afterwards. And I'm sure, I have no doubt that if those Pacific Island states had that information in that period, we would have seen um, sea level rise addressed in the convention. That's my personal view, not that of the commission of course, my personal view. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. And I think that's something we see at the international level, but also in national law, that we have to deal with legal concepts that were simply never invented, never construed, never developed to tackle this global and complex challenge. I mean, that starts with causation and legal standing in, in climate litigation before domestic courts. And at the international level, we also see that there is always this lagging behind of the law in terms of incorporating the scientific evidence, the knowledge that we simply didn't have in 1989. Uh, so I think there's maybe something to look forward to when we celebrate um, the birthday of UNCLOS next year uh, <laughs> to 
<laughs> to uh, make a particular present. And uh, uh, so that is something to look forward in the future. But um, yeah, I think this has really, after reading the IPCC report again last night, given me some hope and uh, uh, some energy back to fight for, you know, uh, particular work streams in COP26 and uh, to follow uh, through the work that we can do, um, uh, these high level negotiations that are coming up. And I'm sure that this lecture has done a tremendous, or has played a tremendous role in preparing us and uh, enhancing our knowledge uh, on this uh, very important issue on the oceans. And uh, I can't see any further questions in the audience. And I think uh, you've given us so much information and so much to, think about and then come back with more questions uh, that I think I would uh, close this lecture unless you want to add something Nilofa. No, thank you. Thank you, uh, Petra, for number one, your excellent moderation. And I enjoyed our um, conversation about this. And, and again, um, I, I hope we know we can follow up on these issues. And uh, it's very important and we'll see what happens in Glasgow. But I thank all the participants uh, for joining us today and for your excellent questions. And, um, and let's keep in touch. Yes, thank you again very much, Nidhu, for absolute, uh, absolutely fascinating, very insightful lecture. So this was lecture eight and lecture nine is already coming next month. I know this is a reminder that time is flying. So please bear with us. There are more lectures uh, to come, exciting topics again. And so thank you for the audience, for your engaging questions, for uh, staying with us throughout this series, for Stan, for his uh, support behind the scenes. As always, it's very much appreciated. And again, thank you very much, uh, Nilofa. And uh, I hope I will see everyone soon again for the next lecture. Thank you. Very good. Bye.